Hi there, uh, welcome everybody to yet another lecture on cryptography, but there are a few things different this time. So in particular, as you see, I'm now in my home office rather than the EAK streaming studio, which means uh, we have some other channels for communication. So you see already that if you post something in the chat, you will see it here on top and I can hopefully react to it rather quickly. Um, if you have any questions or comments that maybe need a bit more discussion, which are also okay if I do them a few slides later, or if you don't want your name to appear up there, you can also connect to um, Menti and I will see somewhere here if you ask a question there. Um, you can also, if you find something confusing or so, use these reactions. If you push on them a lot, I will also see it and maybe I can re-explain stuff. Um, you find the link to the Menti uh, right in the YouTube description, but I will also um, show the uh, number again a bit later. Okay, so what's the topic for today? Um, we're still talking about symmetric encryption and we're still talking about modes of operation, but today our topic is going to be modes of operation for encryption. So to recall a bit what we've already done, um, in the first few lectures we were talking all the time about primitives, about block ciphers, permutations, tweakable block ciphers, at least a tiny bit, um, and about their cryptanalysis. And last week, as well as in today's exercises, we talked about modes for authentication. So modes for uh, asserting the integrity of some data, which included last week hash functions as well as message authentication codes. And we're going to revisit uh, this part of it today, or at least reuse what we've already defined last week because um, the topic for today is encryption modes, so modes for um, guaranteeing the confidentiality of data, but we're not going to look only at pure encryption modes, but also at authenticated encryption modes. And these are modes which combine encryption with authentication. So that's the plan for today. Um, I also want to remind you a bit uh, about, of the broader schedule that we have for this lecture. So you, will, you see here that um, the lecture part about symmetric cryptography is almost at its end. Uh, we have one last lecture on this today. And then um, in two weeks time, we will start with asymmetric cryptography. So we will have several lectures on asymmetric primitives like elliptic curves, post-quantum primitives, but also the classical discrete logarithm and factoring primitives. However, before we come there, we also have a sort of finisher for the symmetric part in the exercises. Namely, next week will be the first exercise exam. Uh, this exam is going to cover the first five exercise sheets, um, though probably not so much from the very first one, which was a bit introductory. And what's relevant for the exam is essentially everything we did in the exercises except for the more complicated stuff and the bonus tasks. So if you couldn't follow all of the bonus tasks or didn't solve them, don't worry. We won't set you any programming tasks or so for the exam. Rather, the idea is that if you were able um, the respective, uh, to solve the respective first four tasks on each sheet, you should be very well prepared for what's coming up in the exam. Uh, I'm not going to ask the exact same questions, but if you understand the techniques that we saw in the exercises, you will be able to apply them here. Um, so in particular, notice that even though we have a new exercise sheet for this symmetric modes lecture from today, we will only cover the content of this after the exam, so it will also not be part of the exam. So it's only up to the exercise sheet that we solved today. Um, as for the practical execution of this, um, of this uh, exam. I already explained this a bit in the beginning, uh, namely um, that we're having a fully virtual mode for this, not only for the exercises, but also for the exams. So you're going to be answering those at home. Uh, the idea is that um, we offer communication channels similar to the exercises where you can ask questions and where we introduce the exam in the beginning. So we will be using Discord and or Teams. I have prepared um, a preference poll for you on the next slides to decide this for the two um, exercise groups. And then for the exam itself, 
uh, we will have individualized um, exam sheets. So everybody will um, receive a separate uh, selection of tasks. Of course, we're working hard to make them equally difficult and provide an equally good coverage of the different exercise sheets, but you will get your own questions. And you can then solve them um, by yourself in the given exam time, which is 90 minutes. You can do that in whatever your way you like, uh, so that at the end you come up with a PDF you can send to us. So for example, the most straightforward way is probably if you have a printer, you print out the assignment sheet that you receive. Um, we will send you an email where you can get that, uh, your individual um, exam task. So the straightforward way is print it, then you can fill it out by hand in a reasonably readable way. And then you can, if you have a scanner, scan it back in, or if you just have a mobile phone, um, you can um, photograph it. Ideally with some tool that is um, well suited for uh, scanning um, for scanning paper, for example, Cam Scammer, uh, Scanner, not Scammer, <laughs> Cam Scanner is a, is a good um, tool for this, which already produces um, a PDF as a result. Um, another way to do this, if you have a tablet, is you can simply fill in the assignment sheet on your tablet using a PDF editor like Xern or whichever tool you are using. And then send me that. Or you can, if you have neither a tablet nor a printer, also try to answer the um, questions on a blank paper and um, just make clear which uh, answers are for which question. Uh, in that case, um, you might still find it useful to have some PDF viewer where you can also make some notes or some drawing program where you can open the PDF. Because if you remember, we've had a number of exercise sheets which had pictures, like for example, in the differential cryptanalysis case or in the stream cipher case where we had these key streams. I think in these cases, it's always useful if you can draw on top of the assignment sheet. And so if you can do that in any tool that you like, I've seen that many of you already did something like that for the homework, then this is also fine and you can attach it at the end to the PDF. Um, so in particular, what would be good is if, uh, as a preparation beforehand is if you have a look at however you get your solution as you're planning it into a PDF, whether that is by converting uh, some uh, JPEGs into one uh, consecutive uh, PDF or whether that's uh, taking several PDF pages that you have and concatenating them, have a look at that beforehand, ideally, so that you don't have any last minute um, issues with that. We will also ask you to sign an Eidesstattliche Erklärung, where you confirm that you didn't cheat for this exam. Because obviously you will be sitting at home, uh, so I can't really uh, tell, um, well, I don't want to list ways of cheating here, but um, I know that there are some ways and uh, here you will uh, sign an Eidesstatt, so this is serious, that you haven't used any ways of uh, cheating for this, but that you have solved the tasks independently. Let's have a look at the question we have there. Is it a closed book exam? Um, yes, it is essentially a closed book exam, but it's okay for me if you have a look at your own previous um, notes from the exercises. So this is okay with me. Um, what you're not supposed to do is talk to each other, um, use somebody um, else's uh, prepared uh, solutions or so that you didn't work on yourself. So it's okay if you take any notes that you yourself prepared from the exercises, in particular if they are your own solutions. It's not okay to use anything else. Um, okay, uh, let's have a look at uh, other questions, I see there is something going on in uh, Menti, I think. Um, let's have a look. Ah, it was a comment, not a question. Cool setup. Yes, uh, thanks. I also actually like it quite a bit more than the one at IIK, um, but it does make the interaction a bit more difficult. On the other hand, uh, the interactive part that I was hoping for in the lecture hasn't really worked that well so far either. So. Um, maybe this one is actually better. Okay, um, let's get back to the um, 
part here. So if there are still um, any questions of this, um, you can enter them in the uh, chat right now. But uh, while you do that, um, I have some questions regarding your preferences, how we will supervise this exam. So the idea is that you are in some voice chat with us during the entire exam. Uh, so that if you have questions, for example, how should I interpret this part of the assignment sheet or so that you can ask. Um, and um, yeah, that we are also able to um, have a bit of an overview that everybody is here and so on. Um, and the idea is to do that in one of the platforms we've been using for the exercises, but we haven't fixed yet in which one, um, because I would like your preferences on that. So first I would last ask only the people in group one. So the people who are in my group in the exercises, what would you prefer? So um, how would you like using MS Teams as in the exercises? Do you hate it? Do you love it or something in between? And how much would you like to use um, Discord? So in particular, if you know that this platform doesn't work for you, you should be here. And if the setup works very well for you, you should be somewhere here. Um, if we have a very diverging um, um, situation here, then um, we'll uh, have a look how we can satisfy as many people as possible. If you have any strict constraints, so if you know that something doesn't work, you can also drop us a message to clarify this. Um, the same thing goes to if you think that you are for some technical reasons not capable of uh, participating in the exam as I just described it. So what you would need is um, an option to join one of these two uh, platforms and some way of solving um, the stuff on paper or in the PDF and hand me in a PDF at the end. That's essentially what we would need. Um, okay, um, let's have a look at the results so far. So um, Discord has mostly good opinions, but uh, one or two very bad ones. And um, MS Teams is very mixed. So some people hate it even though they use it every week or because they use it every week, I don't know. And the other part like it. So since there is more dislike for this solution here, I have a tendency for this, but if you know Discord doesn't work for you, we we'll try to find um, a solution for you. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh yeah, there is one um, advantage in Discord and that is that it's easier to have a separate room where if you have a question on your uh, individual exam, so since all of you have different questions, it's uh, relevant if you have um, uh, something uh, that refers only to your exam, it would be possible to go to a separate room and discuss this with, um, we have a visitor. Um, to discuss this uh, with one of the people who are um, supervising the exam. So this is the other advantage uh, of being in home office, there is occasional CAD content. Okay, so I guess those are all the results we can expect for my group. Let's have a look at the other group, who I think um, might have been joining a bit late, because as far as I heard, um, your exercises took a bit longer today. So here's the same question for the Oh no, please don't type anything in the chat. Here's the question for the other team. So Marcel's team, would you prefer to do this in Microsoft Teams or on Discord? So far this looks like um, a pretty clear result, but there aren't too many votes in yet. So in total we have five people who've said something so far. Um, let's have a look for another few seconds how this develops, but I think the tendency here is um, pretty clear. Okay, so I guess my summary from this would be we will definitely be offering Discord for um, both groups. We cannot, I think, put you in the same channel because you are too many for that. Um, but um, we can make two channels for, for each of the two groups. And for those people on the previous slide, which were in my team and said that they uh, hate the Discord setup, drop me a message um, to let me know the details. Okay, um, I guess since the trend is clear, we can uh, continue at this point and also have another look at the um, questions that we have here. So let's see, um, 
is um, the submission required within the 90 minutes of exam time. Uh, the idea is that you have 90 minutes fully for working on the exam, which means we will add some extra minutes and a bit of um, buffer at the end um, to allow you to uh, first print out the exam and then um, submit it at the end. So a default solution here would be that you give, we give you something like 100 minutes, where we assume that you take five minutes to print out and five minutes to hand it in at the end. Plus, if you don't manage in the time, you can drop me a message um, and say, I have this and this technical problem. I will be submitting 10 minutes later. So, so this will be accepted, but we will, I will write you an email with the exact regulations, since this depends among other things on what you decided on the previous slide. So in any case, the goal is that you have 90 minutes to work and then a little more time to submit. Where will you upload your solutions? Um, my original um, plans were to do that somewhere you can log in, so either in Sticks or in, um, in the Teach Center. However, um, judging from the experience I have with Sticks, uh, I think this is not the best idea because if everybody uploads their thing at the same time, I am not convinced that it will survive. So um, what I think is that we will uh, offer you um, an email uh, option for this. So you can either email it or we offer you a place where you can upload it if it's too big for email. So if your solution is something like uh, two or three megabytes, just email it. We will give you exact um, instructions what the uh, subject and uh, uh, address um, for submission will be and if it's too big for that we will give you an option to um, upload it. Um, is there a need of a camera or microphone? You will not need a camera. You may want to have a microphone ready because you may want to ask questions. Um, if you plan to work on paper it could also be helpful to have a camera ready in order to be able to ask um, questions. So uh, for this um, you will probably either want to have a camera or the ability to screen share. Um, a comment on this question asking thing. So uh, if it's anything that you want to know that would tell other people part of the solution, of course you are not allowed to share that in the public room. So what you uh, should not do is post your entire solution and say is this correct question mark. You also wouldn't do this uh, in a real exam, handing around your sheet and asking is that correct. Um, what you can do is, um, even without screen sharing or a camera, is simply ask what do you mean by that word? How should I interpret this question? Um, do you expect me to also additionally do this in my answer? Something like that you can always ask by using just your microphone. Um, and. Um, if you have more complicated detailed questions like, I don't know, can you read what I mean here? Uh, is this legible? Then we probably want to do this in a separate room and uh, there you can screen share or show with your camera what you mean. I hope that uh, sort of answers it. So it's not necessary, but it's recommended to have a microphone. Okay. Um, I guess that's it with the questions for now. Let's get back to the slides and let's have a look at what we actually plan today for the main lecture. So um, what's the outline for today? It actually looks pretty similar to last week's lecture in the sense that we first have a bit of a general um, um, section where we just want to define briefly what we approximately want. So what sort of security property we want to reach. Uh, there is a request for a cat. Cat is lying there and cleaning herself. So I don't know if she's be, she'd be willing to join, but let's see. And afterwards we have two blocks where we are talking about different schemes that we can build to satisfy the security notion. And the first um, scheme type of schemes is going to be encryption schemes. Um, so plain encryption and the second one is going to be authenticated encryption which combines this stuff here 
with message authentication codes. In each of those, we first want to define what do we mean um, if we say that this sort of, uh, of, of, uh, of scheme is secure. We want to look at some constructions and look at what their um, problems are, um, as well as some attacks that you, can, um, that you can mount on them. And in the case of authenticated encryption, we are going to look at two types of constructions, namely generic constructions, which combine an encryption scheme plus a MAC, and so-called dedicated constructions, which um, sort of intertwine the encryption and the MAC to get something more efficient in the end. So let's first have a look at what security notion we want to achieve. Uh, this is all about confidentiality. So in German, Vertraulichkeit um, of data which means we want to provide, prevent unauthorized entities from learning information, such as the message content um, of some data that authorized parties are communicating or processing. So we have this distinction of authorized parties who are exchanging information and should all be able to read what's going on and unauthorized parties which aren't supposed to be able to read what's going on. And um, so what we're trying to hide is the content of some messages. In particular, there are some related notions that are different, which are not trying to hide the content of a message, but for example, the identity of who did something, so of the sender of a message or someone who did an action, or um, which is yet something different, um, privacy, where um, we also don't want to hide who did something, but we want to allow individual users the option to decide which parts of information about themselves are made public and which ones are not. So what we're focusing on is this here on top. If you're more interested in this part here, there is a separate master level lecture on that, which is called Privacy Enhancing Technologies, uh, where you can learn quite a number of cryptographic and non-cryptographic methods um, to achieve this. We will also have a brief preview of this at the very end of this course. Okay, so this is the notion we are aiming for. And there are now different types of schemes which achieve that. What they all have in common is that they take as an input some key material and some message, and they produce as a result some ciphertext. So that's what they all have in common, um, but the details are different. So the simplest case is what you probably expect and what the content of the first half of the lecture is going to be, which is plain encryption schemes where the key material is shared between both parties. We're still talking about symmetric cryptography and you gain only confidentiality, meaning nobody's able to read stuff. People might be able to modify stuff and we will also see today that these usually only satisfy a very limited notion of confidentiality and that for what you actually want to um, have in terms of confidentiality, you already need the authenticated version, authenticated encryption, which is encryption plus um, providing authenticity. And these two are going to be the content for today, whereas next week uh, we want to have a look at the asymmetric version, uh, namely key encapsulation schemes, where uh, you don't need the secret key to encrypt, but just the public key, but only the intended recipient can read this. Okay, so these two plan for today. We're going to look at this um, later in the asymmetric part. Now, I would again like some input from you and I also see that there are some questions. So let's have a look at the question first. Um, do you provide an old exam to help us to prepare for the exam? Um, I don't, but I can give you the clue that the <laughs> Uh, exams are uh, the exercises we did in the um, in the normal exercise sheets are very close to that so in particular in the past few years I have several times adopted an old exam task into the written exercises and vice versa used one of the written exercises to instead do um, an exam task so what sort of task can you um, expect something that is similar to what we've done. So if I think of the past few lectures, um, what was today's exercises? In today's exercises, we looked at different constructions for compression functions, 
and saw or considered how vulnerable they are. So can I find pre-images, um, collisions and so on? How much do they cost? We had a look at different ways of defining compression functions. This would be an obvious sort of task to also give in the exam. Give you another construction for a compression function and ask you what you can do, which of the techniques we saw you can apply. Or what else did we saw, see today? Um, we saw this uh, MAC construction um, where you also use the vulnerability of the MAC, um, of the CBC MAC to produce something. Something similar could also be part of the exam. So a slightly different MAC construction or a slightly different mode of operation where you can use similar techniques as we saw. If I think back what was in the um, in the uh, exercises before that, we had a differential cryptanalysis where the tasks included things like you're given a cipher, you're given some data, find out something about the key. Whether this was for one round or for several rounds and whether this was a Faisal or um, a substitution permutation network, these are all things that you should also be able to do for the exam. Um, so you should be able to um, understand how characteristics works, you should be able to find them, you should be able to distinguish between properties which hold with probability 1, so which are guaranteed, um, and some that have a differential probability less than 1, so which only happen with a certain probability. What did we have in the lecture before that? It was um, stream surface and lightweight crypto. Um, to be honest, I can't remember all the tasks there, but some of the tasks included um, finding a small stream cipher that fits a particular pattern, finding um, some information about LFSRs used in a, um, in a construction with a nonlinear output function. Uh, what else did we have? I don't remember the details, but anything of that pattern is something that you, that you should expect. Um, and the lesson before that, we had a lot of these um, two block and three block attacks. What else did we do in the first lecture? Um, we looked at some generic compositions, how to build one primitive from another, like a compression function from uh, a hash function uh, from a block cipher. This would also be a very typical task to ask. So it will not be exact copies of what you saw in the exercises, but you will need the same techniques that you learned in the exercises. Of course, in the exercises for each new task, there was a new technique that you learned. Um, I'm not asking you to learn completely new techniques um, in, or come up with them during the exam, um, but it will not be exactly the same as in the exercises. Mark um, is answered. How many questions will there be in the exam? So it's going to be like in the exercises that you have several questions with sub-questions. Um, if I remember correctly from the last years, I usually had either, either two or yet another visitor. So in the exercises we had either two or, uh, in the last years we had either two or three or sometimes four tasks. And each of the tasks always had several subtasks. And this is going to be similar here. And in total, um, I think the number of points you could reach in the last years was, I think that's written in the first, um, first lecture. I think in total it's like 16 points or so. And every subtask is typically approximately worth two points. That's a rule of thumb. Some are worth three, some are worth one but that gives you an approximate idea of the number of sub-questions to expect. Okay, um, that seems to be it for now. So let's head back to what I actually wanted to do, uh, namely to ask you, um, oh, that's the wrong question. I think I skipped the question I actually wanted to ask. I didn't include it here. Anyway, okay, then there are no questions at this point here, and we just continue with uh, the actual content. So what I wanted to ask you here, but apparently I didn't include it in the Menti, is um, which encryption schemes you already know. So which names of encryption schemes you can come up with. But I guess we'll have to skip that and jump to the actual content. So um, 
First, the goal of protecting only encryption. Uh, first, a brief overview. Uh, what sort of primitives are we going to build our encryption schemes from? Well, essentially all that we saw so far except compression functions. So compression functions are really for um, hashing and authenticity, whereas for encryption what we usually want is something that we can invert. Because in many cases we will need to encrypt something and then decrypt. And this invertible thing might be either a regular block cipher, which includes just the key as an additional input that controls this mapping, or it might be a tweakable block cipher that includes the key as well as some additional tweaks that also modifies the mapping. Or it might be something like a permutation, which doesn't have any additional inputs, but usually has a very big block size as an input instead. Where we don't really distinguish between the individual roles of secret key and, um, and tweak. And we're going to see uh, an example of that as well. Okay. Um, I said here that compression functions are not so useful. Actually, a bit later, we're going to come to a point or an example of an encryption scheme where we can work with non-invertible building blocks. Uh, but this is not the typical case, and this is not how we've classically built things. So, um, knowing these primitives, um, you might already um, uh, guess that there are some that some of these can be translated into relatively simple encryption schemes because they already essentially do what we want. They have the inputs that we want and the outputs that we want. The only problem is that the input in this primitive has a fixed size and we want to be able to extend this functionality to a bigger size, to messages of arbitrary size. So uh, one of the simplest ways uh, to do this is something you, most of you have probably previously heard about uh, and most of you are probably aware that you shouldn't do namely to simply apply this block cipher to every block that you have, and that's it. Uh, this is also called the electronic codebook mode or ECB, because it, looks, it uses this sort of codebook here and simply translate one block by one block using the same codebook, where a codebook means um, a block cipher with just one fixed key, because this is sort of a lookup table that translates one thing to something of the same size. Why should you not use it? I guess those of you who know that you shouldn't use it have already seen the reason for it, namely this famous penguin picture here, which illustrates one of the two problems this mode has. Namely, whenever you have a sort of pattern in the input or some repeating inputs, then you will see the same pattern in the output. So in this example here, assuming we are going to use a very simple image format that has, for example, lots of whites here on the top, so the images something like this, uh, then all of these blocks are going to be translated to the same block in the encrypted version. So you can see patterns of the um, plain text in the ciphertext. Um, there is a second problem here, namely that not only patterns within the plain text are preserved, but also whenever you try to encrypt the exact same message twice, the um, full ciphertext is also going to be the same. So this is like preserving patterns not only on block level, but on message level. Uh, so I call the one thing here patterns, namely the patterns repeat, and I call the message-wide patterns the context, because this um, encryption scheme here does not depend on any context in the sense of the time when this message was sent, or the role of this message. This can't be included here, and this is a massive problem. Now, to define why this is a massive problem, we need to define the security notion we want to achieve, and then we can argue that the previous scheme doesn't satisfy that. So the standard security notion for encryption schemes uh, is called indistinguishability under chosen plain text attacks, or short int CPA, where the int is for indistinguishability and the CPA is for chosen plain text attack. So, the intuitive meaning of this is that an attacker who observes output of the cipher shouldn't be able to distinguish this output from something random or from some sort of randomized behavior. And this should be even when the attacker is able to 
uh, have messages of their choice encrypted during while executing the attack. So you have an oracle that you can query for some information. Now to put this into more formal terms, um, we can define something like the following. I have to say here that there are actually several ways of um, defining this uh, indistinguishability and several of them are equivalent to each other, but this is the most classical one. And it says the following. So it defines a security game, a challenge for the attacker that the attacker should not be able to solve. And if the attacker manages to solve this game, so to win in this game, then we say that they've executed an attack. And this should only be possible with either a lot of effort or with very low success probability. So what is this, this security game that we define? We say an attacker is first as a uh, preparation step um, allowed to um, Oh, I've written a different definition here, I just see. Okay, so the original definition, the classical one, maybe let's explain that first, is that an attacker um, can prepare two plain texts of their choice, message one and message two, and then one of the two is encrypted and the attacker receives the ciphertext of this encrypted message. And the attacker now has to guess which of the two messages it is. And if the attacker can guess that with a probability better than random guessing, then they have won the game. So if they um, are able to guess which of the two messages was encrypted with a success probability higher than one half, then they win. That's a classical notion. Uh, but there are also more general ones like the one I've written here, namely um, that an attacker should not be able to distinguish whether they received a correctly encrypted ciphertext. So they are giving one message, the attacker provides one message and the oracle um, answers. And the attacker should not be able to tell, is this the correct answer? So is this actually the ciphertext correctly encrypted for my plaintext? Or is this the encryption of some random garbage message that has only the same length as mine? And even if, if the attacker is able to ask many of these queries, so to always ask, please encrypt me this message and then get something back. She shouldn't be able to tell whether she consistently gets correct ciphertext or she consistently gets um, encryptions of random garbage messages. So in other words, one could also say that um, learning the ciphertexts does not give you any sort of information about the plain texts because you don't even um, know how to distinguish it from uh, encrypted random garbage messages. And if you can't distinguish, then there's obviously nothing to learn about the messages from what you see. So that's the indistinguishability under chosen plain text attacks because the attacker is allowed to ask the encryption of any messages that they like. Um, this is in CPA. However, this is a relatively weak notion because it allows the attacker only to encrypt stuff. And for this reason, there is a second notion that also allows to decrypt stuff. So the attacker can both ask, please encrypt me this message. And in the meantime, she can also ask, please decrypt me this ciphertext and give me the correct message. And this notion is then called indistinguishability under chosen ciphertext attacks in CCA. So this is similar uh, to before, but in addition to the encryption oracle, you have a decryption oracle with the same key. Uh, now there are some additional um, fairness uh, restrictions to make this uh, definition work. Namely, that um, when, um, when the uh, attacker asks the query decryption queries, uh, ask the oracle decryption queries, then she cannot ask the challenge ciphertext that she um, was given or the ciphertexts that were produced from her own messages. So in other words, she cannot test if the encryption of a message and then the decryption gives back the original ciphertext. Uh, because in that case, the organ would have to lie when, um, when returning uh, stuff in the random case. So that wouldn't work. So here, yeah, there are some fairness conditions or some constraints in this game, some extra rules what the attacker is allowed and is not allowed to do in the game. 
Um, there's also a variant of this one, which is called, so this is CCA1, what I've described, and there is a, a notion called CCA2, which additionally allows adaptive queries. So the, in CCA1, the adversary has to prepare all the decryption uh, queries in advance before given the, the challenge plain text for this, whereas in CCA2, these can be adaptive. So she can ask decryption queries after receiving um, the ciphertexts for, for, her, for, for her challenge plain texts. And um, she's allowed to do this, but again, except for the exact ciphertext she has received. So she must change something about the ciphertext before she sends them back. Now, what are generic attacks to, um, to win in these games? One of them is, of course, to try to guess the key, because if you guess what the correct key is, or if you can recover the key, then you can win this game by simply following along um, and computing the decryption and checking whether the result matches or not. So based on these security definitions, let's now um, define uh, what the interface of an encryption scheme is. And um, we can already see here at this point that we definitely are going to need one thing from our encryption schemes, namely the same plain text mustn't always lead to the same ciphertext. Because if that would be the case, then what the attacker could do already in the in CPA game is they could um, ask for the decryption of the uh, two messages that are the challenges. And then while she's trying to guess which of the two was encrypted, she can simply send the same message um, again and look whether the received ciphertext matches the challenge ciphertext or not. And if it matches, um, then um, it was um, um, either the, the correct message or it was the, in, in this version of the notion, it was the correct key instead of the random garbage message. And if it doesn't match, it was either in the two message case, the other message, or in this description here, it was a garbage message. So we, we need some sort of randomization. And the source of this randomization is of course, the nonce or number used only once, which we will feed to the encryption scheme as an additional input. So in total, we have the following inputs and outputs for our encryption scheme, which we denote by uh, calligraphic E, just like we denoted hash functions um, by calligraphic H. And D is the corresponding decryption. So both of them get as input the key, the secret key, plus the nonce, which is simply a number that is never reused for the same key. So for every fresh message, we need a new nonce. And the actual plain text, which can have an arbitrary length. And the output is going to be a ciphertext, which has approximately the same length as the input message. It can also be a bit longer, depending on the scheme. And we denote the nonce by an n. Some older descriptions um, also call it IV, initial value. And then we have the message and ciphertext, um, a notation we already know from block ciphers. Okay, and as for using the encryption schemes, um, this is very simple. So to encrypt, Alice takes her secret key that she must somehow have shared with Bob previously, plugs it into the encryption scheme together with the nonce and uh, the message, receives a ciphertext, transmits the ciphertext together with the nonce. So this is important. The recipient must always learn the nonce in some way, either because Alice sends it along or because Bob can predict it, for example, because it's a simple counter. And Bob plugs the nonce together with the ciphertext and the secret key into the decryption algorithm to receive back the message. Um, so this is the modern representation. The more classical representation or alternative model here is that um, we do not generate this nonce externally and feed it as an input, but instead, um, we only feed the message in, and this is a randomized algorithm which internally generates the nonce and concatenates it to the ciphertext. So in that model, the nonce is not an input of the encryption scheme, but an output. But it still must be sent along together with the ciphertext, and it still must be put into the decryption algorithm. And um, 
you will also see this different behavior in libraries. So in some libraries, you can generate the nonce as an input for your encryption scheme, and in some, you are given the nonce. Um, the advantage of um, forcing the user to provide it as input um, is that it makes the user more flexible. So for example, um, in case the nonce is implicitly clear because it's a message counter, um, then we can make the transition here, uh, the transmission a bit more efficient. Um, and of course, you also have simply full control over the algorithm and you don't have randomized behavior in your functions. On the other hand, the advantage of generating the nonce internally is that you do not give the user of the library the option to do mistakes here, to accidentally generate the nonce in an insecure way. For example, by allowing nonce values to repeat or in some schemes also by allowing them to be predictable. Because some encryption schemes have this additional uh, requirement that the nonce must be unpredictable for the attacker, otherwise we have a problem. And this requirement is a bit of a remnant of this old model where the nonce was generated in here. Okay, so this is the interface. Let's have a look at two constructions. Uh, one of them, which we already know from the lecture on message authentication codes, namely the cipher block chaining mode. Uh, so in this mode, in order to make sure that uh, identical messages don't leave, lead to identical ciphertexts, we first um, initialize a sort of chaining value with the nonce. So this chaining value is going to be a random looking value that um, prevents identical message blocks from being translated to the same ciphertext blocks. So initially we put in this uh, nonce here, we encrypt the result, so the XOR of the message in nonce to get the first ciphertext block, and then we use the ciphertext block as a randomizer to randomize the input to the next block cipher call. Again, by XORing it to the message, taking the ciphertext block and so on. So in other words, every ciphertext blocks block depends on the nonce and all message blocks so far. So the current one and all previous ones. Uh, meaning that, for example, even if between two messages, the last message block is the same, we won't see it here because their history, their context so far is going to be different. That's the essential idea. However, this idea comes with quite a number of disadvantages. Uh, in particular, um, all the operations must be computed consecutively. So the nice parallelism of um, ECB is gone. Um, and um, we also um, we have some additional requirements for the nonce. Namely, this must be unpredictable. Um, so it has to be a random value. It cannot be a counter. Um, this is because the nonce is in the beginning XORed to the message and if the attacker would be able to choose the nonce at this point um, while also choosing the message in one of these security games, they could simply do something like um, choose one message and the corresponding nonce and then choose a second message where they flip the last bit and they also flip the last bit in the nonce, meaning the XOR of the two stays the same and then they will produce exactly the same stream here. And um, you can think this through for yourself, why this violates the security notion that we saw. So uh, in addition to never repeating, this nonce must be unpredictable or not controllable by the attacker. Uh, otherwise, we cannot get the security notion. There are some other very important things to know about the security of this node, some limitations that they have. And um, one of them is that this mode of encryption enforces a message limit. So there is a maximum number of messages that can be securely encrypted with this node. And this maximum number is approximately um, 2 to the n divided by 2. So you can already guess this has something to do with collisions and with the birthday paradox. So even though, of course, technically you could uh, encrypt as much data as you like with this scheme, and you could even encrypt 2 to the n messages without ever repeating the nonce, this is not secure to do. 
So already after way fewer messages, you run into a problem. And this problem would allow the attacker to break the confidentiality by learning something about the message that they shouldn't. Any ideas what might be the case here or what the reason might be? So if you have an idea, you may write it in the chat. Hmm. No ideas are incoming, then um, let's have a look at the solution. So let's assume that we have already encrypted more than this number of blocks. So more than 2 to the n divided by 2, where n is the block size of the block cipher. Now, due to the birthday paradox, if we look at all the cipher blocks we've encrypted so far, all the um, cipher text blocks we've received, then, because of the birthday paradox, this is a sufficient number of candidate blocks that with a very high probability, there are going to be two identical ciphertext blocks. Some block number i and some block number j. Um, and if we look at how these blocks were computed, uh, we see the following. So this block here was computed by taking the previous ciphertext block, XORing it to the current message block, it's called P here instead of M, but this refers to the message, and then plugging this into the encryption scheme. And now if the two, these two outputs of the block cipher were the same, so if you think back of the previous picture, for example, if these two um, blocks were the same, because they were both output of a bijective block cipher, it means also the inputs must have been the same. So in particular, this input here for the one block must have been the same as this one here for the other block. Now I can rearrange this equation by putting the two ciphertexts which we know on the one side and putting the two plain texts that we know on the other side. So XORing PI to both sides and XORing CJ minus 1 to both sides. Then we get this equation here, which tells us that the difference, the XOR of these two ciphertext blocks which I know must be exactly the same as the difference or XOR of these two plain text blocks which I shouldn't know. No, I can't come feed you now. Somebody's begging for attention and for food. Okay, so what this means is that by just observing the ciphertext blocks, I can learn some information about the plaintext, namely the XOR of the two, which could already tell me quite a lot. So for example, if the XOR is zero, I know that the two blocks were the same. And there are of course many other sorts of um, conclusions that I could draw. So I definitely learn something. Um, and this sort of attack, which happens after I encrypt too many blocks, this is particularly critical if the block size of the block cipher is too small. So in particular, if I'm using something like triple des, which has a 64-bit block size, then after already 2 to the 32 blocks, which is just a few gigabytes, I can expect to find such a collision and thus to learn a bit of information about the plain text. Now, this bit of information may look like very little. However, if you consider that in many messages, um, only part of the message is secret. So for example, um, I, I'm doing an uh, HTTPS connection and I know most of the website content because it's a fixed structure. I only don't know some specific values in there. For example, um, some specific um, passwords or um, bank balances or so that are transmitted as part of the message. Or the cookies that are um, secret parts of cookies that are transmitted in the beginning. Uh, and in that case, if I happen to know one of the two blocks and one of the other two blocks is a secret value, then I learn this secret block. Um, and this was exploited, for example, in the Suite 32 attack, where the 32 refers to the 2 to the 32 complexity of the attack. So this was uh, demonstrated practically, for example, on some VPN connections where it was possible to force transmission of a few gigabytes. So this can be a practical constraint and it's a very important reason not to use block ciphers with a small block size. 
Um, let's have a look at a few other properties of this CBC mode. In particular, at its security level. So we said already that there are potential problems when we don't have a nonce already with int CPA, but there are definitely problems with int CCA2. So with this um, indistinguishability under um, chosen ciphertext attacks. And to, to see this problem, let's have a look at um, the simple case here where I'm looking just at one block messages. So I'm encrypting two one block messages with different nonces and getting the resulting ciphertext blocks. Then um, I'm giving the uh, attacker now a similar um, challenge as before. So I'm encrypting, the oracle is encrypting one of the two blocks for them, is giving the attacker the ciphertext block, which is either the first or the second ciphertext block. And the attacker has to guess. And the attacker is allowed to query the encryption of any other message that they like, as well as the decryption of any message that they like. And what they can now do when they have the decryption oracle is the following. They can ask for the decryption of an adaptive chosen ciphertext. For example, they take um, the challenge ciphertext that they have received and they ask for the decryption, but they have to change something. They aren't uh, allowed to ask for the exact same thing, but they could do something like only changing the nonce for the decryption. You remember that the nonce also goes into the decryption algorithm independent of which model you have. So whether the encryption is randomized or takes the nonce as input, the decryption definitely takes the nonce as input. So if you simply change the nonce by XORing some value, for example, flipping one bit, then there are now two cases for what the um, what the attacker receives as an answer. Either um, this uh, ciphertext here was indeed ciphertext one, which was encrypted under this nonce. In that case, the decryption here, what would it do? So decrypting the same um, ciphertext block will lead to the same result here. I would XOR the nonce, so the nonce here cancels out, and all that remains is whatever delta I x write on top here. For example, flipping one bit. And this will be added to the original message. So if that's the case, then they would receive an, as an answer the modified uh, message m1 x or whatever bit flip I did. And if I receive that as an attacker, I guess that the message that was encrypted is the first one here. If I receive something else, then I guess it must have been the other case which is either the second message or some garbage message or whatever notion you like. So this is something uh, that you can always do with um, this uh, CBC mode. And it's the reason why this mode is not CCA2 secure. Um, there is one other thing that we haven't yet um, talked about in more detail. And that is what sort of padding scheme makes sense for this here. Because if you look back at the picture here, you see that um, this only works if the thing we're putting into the encryption scheme has a length which is a multiple of the block size. And um, this means we must ensure that all the messages we want to encrypt fit this pattern. Pattern. So we must fill up all messages in a secure way to the block size. And the important thing here is we must have a rule here that is uniquely decodable. So what doesn't work is I only fill it up if it isn't yet a multiple of the block length, because in that case, the attacker couldn't distinguish whether the, for example, the L blocks that they get are L complete message blocks, or whether this last block actually contains some padding. This is why CPC mode um, must define a padding scheme, and this must be a scheme which always um, always adds a padding, not just, <laughs> not just in some cases. So um, what padding schemes do we have for CBC? There are two relatively widely used ones. The first of them is one that you might have seen in the InfoSec exercises in case you did it last year. Namely the so-called PKCS number seven scheme. Um, so this does the following. It depends a number of bytes at the end. So the blue thing here is the last 
potentially incomplete block of the message. And here would be a multiple block length. And it adds at the end something between one and block size divided by eight bytes. Um, so in other words, either uh, something between one byte and the length of the block size in bytes. So it never happens that nothing is appended. In case the message was already a uh, multiple of the block length, we're in this last case here and we add the full thing. And what we add defines how many bytes we add. So if we add one, add one byte, then this byte is one and so on. And this means that when I uh, decrypt my ciphertext with CBC and I get as a result the padded message, I can uniquely decode this padded message to the original message because the last byte always tells me how many bytes I have to remove from the padded message in order to get the original. Um, now there is, this is nice and this works, but it's a bit inefficient, right? So even if I send only a one block message, I will always have to encrypt two blocks. And for this reason, there is an additional trick that you can do for this particular encryption scheme, which is called ciphertext stealing. And with this trick, um, you can achieve that the message has the same, um, the padded message has the, or the ciphertext has the same length as the unpadded message this way around. So here's an illustration of ciphertext stealing. And it's a bit tricky, it does the following. So it starts by encrypting normally. And then in the penultimate block, so the one before the last block, only a part of the ciphertext is actually put into the ciphertext that is um, given as a result of the algorithm. So uh, how many or how much of this last block is kept depends on how long the last incomplete message block is. So for example, if the message is one byte longer than a multiple of the block size, then from this penultimate ciphertext, we only keep the first byte. We cut off the rest and don't return it as a result of the algorithm. However, this information is not lost because this value we have here will be used again in the last block where it's XORed to the last message block. The message is padded with zeros before this. So it's XORed to that, put into the last um, block cipher call. And here we now complete uh, keep the complete last block. So before outputting, we usually also swap the two so that the incomplete one is the last one in order to be able to separate where the end between the two is. Okay, so this means that the final message has exactly the same um, length as the original one because this one has the length of that one and this one has the length of that one. Uh, now, why does this work? Why is it decryptable when we cut something away and throw it away? So it works because um, as the person who decrypts this, I can decrypt the first few blocks as normal. But for the last block, so I skip this first, I decrypt this part here, I receive that value. And now based on the um, length of the uh, last block that I received, I know how much of this is the extra part uh, that was cut away here um, because this is um, XORed with zero here, so not changed, and it has the length exactly uh, block size minus the length of this one here. So I now know the missing half of this cipher text block here, which allows me to decrypt back here. And additionally, um, by uh, knowing this part of the cipher text here, I can also compute forward here XOR it to what I got here and thus decrypt back to this M here. So this works because I can recover part of the ciphertext from this state here and I know that this block here was padded with zeros. So that's the idea of ciphertext stealing. So it's a bit inconvenient or more complicated to implement, but it saves you um, something in the size of the ciphertext that you transmit. We also have other modes of operation where we don't even need this sort of trick uh, because the ciphertext doesn't need to be, or the plaintext doesn't need to be padded to begin with. And one of these is the counter mode of operation. 
which we some of you have already used in today's exercises because they already knew it beforehand, but I'm just re-explaining it here. So unlike the previous mode, this one does not require consecutive computation, it can be parallelized. And here the ciphertext block also do not, uh, does not depend on the previous message blocks, only on the current message block and the position of the current message block. So to encrypt any block of message, we concatenate the nonce with some counter that tells us the index of the block where we currently are. We encrypt this um, nonce plus counter thing to get a key stream here at this point, which depends only on the key and the nonce, not on the message. And we simply XOR that to the message. So it's an example of a streaming mode of operation. Streaming meaning I generate a key stream that depends only on the key and nonce, and I simply XOR that to the message. The, the message itself never enters any primitive. It only enters an XOR, it never goes into a block cipher. So this has some advantages, um, among others, because um, you don't have to wait for the result, so you can prepare this and then quickly XOR it to the message whenever the message appears. Um, it also has some disadvantages, uh, which we come to later. They are related to the um, malleability of the ciphertext. So to how predictable it is when I change something in the ciphertext, what will happen to the corresponding plain text block. Um, this is also the mode I mentioned earlier, where we do not actually need an invertible function. Because when you look at how the decryption works for this mode, you see that the decryption function and the encryption function are actually exactly the same. Both of them generate the key stream and XOR it to what they have received. So for encryption, they XOR the key stream to the message and get the ciphertext. And for the decryption, they generate the key stream, XOR it to the ciphertext and get back the messages. This means um, you don't have any decryption overhead for implementing the decryption of the block cipher because you actually never need it. It also means that you can actually use a non-invertible primitive here. So it wouldn't matter if this block cipher here were actually a pseudorandom function instead of a pseudorandom permutation. So it, it would be allowed to actually have repeating values here in this uh, key stream for um, different inputs. However, in practice we don't really know how to build um, non-invertible functions more efficiently than invertible functions, this isn't much of an advantage. Um, you will maybe see in the exercises that actually if we did have non-invertible building blocks here, the whole scheme would actually be more secure. Okay, now a few comments on the properties of the scheme. Um, first, we do not need any padding at this point. This is because um, we can simply cut off the key stream when we don't need any more of it. So in the last block, if the last message block is only one byte long, we only take the first byte of the block cipher output here, XOR it, and that's it. No padding needed. So here, automatically, the ciphertext has the same length as the plain text without any tricks like ciphertext stealing. Uh, one limitation maybe is that um, this node mode requires that the nonce plus the counter fits into one block. So in the previous mode we saw that the nonce had the same length of the um, as the uh, block cipher block size. And this is nice because block cipher block size is usually 128 bits and 128 bits is also a good nonce length if you want to make sure that a randomly generated nonce doesn't repeat. If I have to make the nonce shorter, then there is a lower number of messages I can encrypt before the nonce repeats. And so it's a bit of a trade-off. I could have a larger um, nonce, then I could encrypt more individual messages, but each message would have to be a bit shorter because the maximum counter for the block index must fit in the block size together with the nonce. So you have a trade-off where you can allow either fewer longer messages to be encrypted or more shorter messages to be encrypted. Um, here, in contrast to the previous scheme, we don't care how the nonce was generated as long as it doesn't repeat. 
It can be random. It can also be something predictable like a message counter, which is convenient because it can be transmitted implicitly. So if you always encrypt your next message with the next higher nonce, then you will never need to send along the nonce because the recipient will just know it. Um, finally, we have a similar birthday effect, which is um, for modes of operation also called the birthday bound, as we had in the previous cipher. Because again, if we use the cipher for more than two to the n over two uh, message blocks to encrypt more than this number of blocks, then we can slightly um, so have a success probability in the game we defined, which is slightly higher than generic. So just a tiny bit, this mode doesn't suffer as much as the previous one when you come close to this number of blocks, but it's still a potential problem. So there is a question right here. Let's have a look. Sorry, you can't read it well here. Let me jump to the next slide, then it's a bit better, but not much. So the question is the following. In counter mode, couldn't we do something like nonce XOR counter instead of appending? This wouldn't limit the blocks per message. That's a very good suggestion. Let's have a look at the, at the picture and let's hide the question here. So the question was, um, let's hide it. Um, the question was, instead of concatenating two here, which limits the length, we could also simply XOR the two values. And indeed, that is an, um, an alternative definition that you find sometimes. However, this has a potential problem. Uh, and this is because by XORing the nonce and the counter, you make it easier to accidentally run into a collision where nonce one XOR counter one equals nonce two XOR counter two. You can imagine that this happens very easily in case you choose your nonce to be a counter. Because then if you look at the first um, value here, you would have the, um, the, the nonce counter and um, a would XOR or one here and then continue encrypting this message. And when you would encrypt the next message, the nonce would be one bigger, which would correspond to XOR in one. And um, if you now look at, so it, it, you need um, an additional, you would need to be able to decrypt the, um, the counter zero here, which doesn't work. So let's have a look at number two and three instead. So in this message, we are, have XOR the nonce with two. And in the other one, we've XOR nonce plus one with two. Now two XOR one equals three. So what we would actually get is the same input at this point as at this point. So um, increasing the counter by one could be compensated by increasing the nonce by one. So using um, a counting nonce would in that case be a very bad idea. You could of course use a random nonce, then the probability of having a collision is smaller. However, um, when you use a counter as a nonce, you are guaranteed that the nonce never repeats for two to the power of the block size. Whereas if you use a random nonce, then it will accidentally repeat after the birthday paradox, so after approximately two to the n over two. So if you use the um, XOR construction, you do have the advantage that you do not limit the uh, length of the messages so much, but you have a way higher risk um, of accidental collisions because you will have to use random nonces um, or random looking nonces and, um, and um, this will um, collide with the birthday paradox. So this is the, the danger. Um, so in the end, one of the cleverest things still turns out to be um, having two separate counters here. Or, um, so in TLS does something slightly different. So there, this part here is also defined differently depending on which TLS version you look. Um, they have different constructions. And in some cases, an XOR is used. However, it's an XOR of a secret value. So it's more difficult for the attacker to notice when, when there are collisions. So in any case, there is no 
super simple solution for this, but it's also not too bad if the block size of the block cipher is big enough. This mode does not work very well if you have small block sizes. So it, um, for example, if you have um, a 64-bit uh, block size, then you would have to have something like a 32-bit nonce and a 32-bit counter. That would be really too small. Okay, um, so that would be it for the pure encryption part for me so far. Now let's have a look at the authenticated encryption case and the motivation for this. So I think we've already seen a bit of the motivation, namely all of the previous schemes so far do not provide protect the authenticity or integrity of the message. So in all of these schemes, what an attacker can do is they can modify the ciphertext a bit, and this will modify the plain text a bit, but it will lead to a, a valid plain text that the receiver might interpret as a correct, correct message. In the simplest case, it's something like a streaming mode where if you flip one bit in the ciphertext, so between C and C prime here, this bit was flipped, the effect on the message will be that the corresponding bit in the message is flipped. So for example, if you know that the number, that the content of the ciphertext here is some bank account details and your bank balance, and you flip a bit that corresponds to a, um, a high significant bit in some integer, you will know that the resulting number is something bigger. If you didn't know the number before, you don't know it afterwards, but you know what you've changed and what the effect was. So this is very bad. And in particular, it contradicts not only the integrity requirement, but it also contradicts the CCA2 security we already defined for encryption, where the adversary is allowed to have an encryption and a decryption orifice. This already cannot be satisfied if there isn't some sort of integrity protection. Now, in other modes, the changes are not so predictable. For example, in CBC, if you flip a bit in the plain text, it will on the one hand flip a bit in the message where this ciphertext block is XORed and it will lead to one garbage block um, because the uh, block cipher probably doesn't have a particularly good differential characteristic for this flip. It will just randomly modify the corresponding input. But still, you know approximately what happens. There is one garbage block afterwards and one bit flip. You might be able to exploit this. In any encryption mode, um, as we've defined it so far, um, even if a bit flip in the ciphertext leads to a completely garbage message, this might still be enough to run an attack. For example, um, if the ciphertext you transmit is just one number, which is likely to be low, whatever your modification you do, the resulting message is likely going to be a much higher number, so as a simple example. So what we want to do is, to protect not only the confidentiality, but also the authenticity of a message, because whichever data is worth encrypting and hiding is probably important enough that you don't want it modified. So we want to combine confidentiality from an encryption mode and authenticity or integrity from a Mac. This is what we want to achieve. Um, this makes it sound like it's pretty easy because we have already defined encryption modes and we have already defined authentication modes. The bad news is that it's very easy to accidentally combine a secure encryption scheme and a secure Mac in a way such that the resulting authenticated encryption scheme is completely insecure. Even if you don't do it in a very stupid way. So what is this authenticated encryption interface that we want to achieve here? It looks a bit like normal encryption, but it has a few more inputs and outputs. I'm denoting it here with AE and AD, where A is for authenticated encryption and this is authenticated decryption. So what are the inputs here? We have the same key and nonce as before, but we now have two inputs of arbitrary size. The first of them is the so-called associated data, or A, and the second is the plain text message, or M. And if we look at the encryption and decryption, you see that the uh, associated data A, this one here, appears in both algorithms as an input. So this is data that is not transformed into an encrypted version, but it is kept as is. It's just protected for its authenticity, it is not encrypted. I just uh, send along with the ciphertext. 
the message, so the plain text, is encrypted and is integrity protected, where integrity protected means the output is some ciphertext plus an additional piece of information, the authentication tag. And now whenever you decrypt something, you might either receive back the original plain text message or if your tag was not correct, you will receive an error symbol instead. So either a message or an error. And now when using this, um, what Alice needs as inputs is, as before, the nonsense message, plus in this case, the associated data. Everything that I've drawn in mostly black here is public stuff. So the associated data is something that can be public. However, it should also be protected from modification. So the outputs are ciphertext and tag. We send along nonce, associated data, ciphertext and tag. The decryption function takes all these, and of course the key, and produces either the message or an error. And like before, we have some additional requirements. The first of them is, as before, that the nonce must never repeat. And there is, however, a second constraint, um, which is somewhat related. So if I violate any of these constraints, it's called a misuse attack. And the second property is that in this decryption function here, I must buffer the partially decrypted message to the very end until I have correctly verified the tag. Only after I've verified the tag can I give out the, the message that I think this ciphertext corresponds to. So what's not allowed is to give out the first few blocks of the message um, unless we've, um, we've verified the, the tag beforehand. So in that case, if there's an error, the only output must be this here. No fragments of the ciphertext. What security notions do we have for this? Again, it will be the challenge for the adversary to distinguish between two cases. And the first case is, again, um, the cipher operated correctly with some secret key K. We also call this the real oracle. And the task of the uh, adversary is going to be to, to distinguish the output of these algorithms from some ideal oracle. Now to think quickly, what should these um, ideal oracles look like? Or what should these two algorithms behave like? We already saw what the encryption should approximately look like. It should look like randomly encrypted stuff. We can also say more generally, the output of this encryption scheme should look like random stuff. So like random garbage bits. So what this part should be indistinguishable from is random garbage bits. Now let's look at the decryption. What should the decryption algorithm look like to an adversary? So what it should do, of course, if I already encrypted something with the scheme, then it should correctly decrypt it back to the message I put in. That much makes sense. However, if I put anything else that I've not received from this algorithm into the scheme, then it shouldn't provide authenticity, meaning it shouldn't accept this message because it was not correctly generated with the correct key. So if I put in anything else into this algorithm, except an output from here, it should output me the error symbol. And this is exactly what the ideal oracle looks like. So um, this one here always returns a random string. And this one here always returns an error symbol, except for consistency with previous queries. This will remind you a bit of the random oracle definition that we saw for hash functions, which also always outputted a random string, except for consistency with previous results. And the attacker's goal, when having access to either these two or those two um, oracles, is to tell which of the two is the case. So to find out, am I talking to this with a secret key, or am I talking to this, which is garbage. And we have again some generic attacks, which include guessing the key K, but they also include trying to randomly guess the tag and hoping that the tag is accidentally correct. So these are two generic attacks here, tag guessing and key guessing. Um, so how can we do this generically? By simply plugging together things we already have. 
this plugging together of things we already have is called generic compositions. And in a simplified view, it could look like the following. So I've simplified it here by leaving out the associated data and leaving out the nonce. And actually, this is quite a big simplification um, because if you do take this into account, first you have way more than three options. You have uh, many, many combinations. And second, the answers are not as simple as I give them here. So this is a word of warning. But here's the simplified view. The first way I could combine a MAC and, um, and an encryption scheme to encrypt and protect my message is I could simply, this is quite obvious, feed the message into both schemes. The one gives me the ciphertext and the other gives me the tag. That's relatively straightforward. Um, this construction is, for example, used in the um, SSH protocol, which you use whenever you make a, when you open an SSH connection. The bad news is that this is not necessarily secure. So even if you have a secure MAC and encryption scheme, this combination might be insecure. And one of the reasons for this is because the MAC does not make any promises to protect the confidentiality of the message. So the tag actually could contain some information about M, even if it's a secure MAC. Um, the second construction is to plug the message into the MAC and then use the tag together with the message and put it into the encryption scheme. Uh, so in other words, I also encrypt the tag together with the message. And the result will be something longer, which implicitly includes the ciphertext and um, a new tag. This is, for, for example, used in SSL TLS. And again, this is only secure in some cases. I can build constructions where this um, combination does not achieve the security notion. The good news is the way it's used in TLS is absolutely fine. Uh, third, I could reverse the order of the two. So this was MAC then encrypt. The alternative is to encrypt then MAC. So first put the message into the encryption scheme and then put the ciphertext into the message authentication code. And the good news is that in the simplified view, when I'm not talking about nonsense, this construction is always secure if the two billing blocks are also secure. And this is the construction that's, for example, used in IPsec. Um, now, as I said, in reality, it's a bit more complicated because we have this associated data to take care of and the nonce is not happening inside this encryption scheme, but we also need to decide whether we use it as an input to the MAC. You saw already in the exercises today an example of such a generic composition where one of the problems was that the nonce did not go into the um, MAC. Okay, um, so what are some things that could go wrong with this here? One of the things that can go wrong is when you use these building blocks um, and put the same key into them. So you saw already here that um, I did write it as if it were the same key twice. However, this can actually be quite a problem. And one example of where this happens is if I try to be super efficient and try to use similar modes for um, encryption and MAC, taking the CVC MAC and the CVC encryption scheme. Now, we don't really have to the time to go into this example in detail, but this is something you can try to uh, work out on your own at home because it's really simple to see what goes wrong here and why this does not provide any authenticity at all. Which um, ciphers are better, so which are widely used? In the current TLS there are three schemes available and two of them share the same primitive but different constructions and two of them, namely um, this one here and this one here, have different primitives inside but have essentially the same construction in the sense of this, a similar mode of operation. So GCM shares one property with this one here and one property with this one here. There are also some other important schemes and we're going to have a look at them in a moment. Let's first have a look at the two classical ones. The first one is the CCM mode. So this is more or less a generic construction. It is in any case uh, something that first computes a MAC and then the encryption. 
So it takes the um, associated data and the message and puts it into a CBC MAC. This is what one of the two C's in the name of CCM stands for. It computes the tag and then it takes the message together with the tag to then encrypt the whole thing and it encrypts it with counter encryption. So the C of counter encryption is the second C in the CCM mode. So it's uh, MAC then encrypt. Additionally, we need to put the nonce into there somewhere and we also need to take the length in there and we need to define the padding and so on. I don't want to go into the details here. Um, there's the uh, second widely used mode, which is the GCM mode, where the G is for Galois field, because uh, instead of using two block cipher calls per block as in the previous case, so here you see two block cipher call to encrypt one message block, this mode tries to avoid it by having a different operation, namely a field operation instead. You will see that this is again a combination of an encryption mode on top here. This is again counter encryption. And the thing on the bottom here is something that we've seen last week. Namely, it's um, the GMAC construction or Galois MAC, which um, computes the tag by always, so it looks a bit like GCM, but instead, of, uh, a bit like CBC, but instead of um, encrypting each block after XORing the previous output, it simply multiplies them with some value h, and h is a sort of second secret key. It's not actually a separate key, it's simply the encryption of zero, but it's also a secret value that the attacker doesn't know. It always multiplies it with this, then XORs the next one, and so on, like in CBC. At the end, it also appends the length of the messages, and then um, to mask this output here, this value here, um, it, um, it depends on nonce dependent value because so far this one here did not depend on the nonce. Um, so we've already seen this construction last week. What are the advantages of this compared to CCM? Well, quite many. Uh, first, this is completely parallelizable in terms of block cipher calls because this multiplication here is not parallelizable, but it's a lot faster than a block cipher call, typically. Um, so this part is serial, but the block cipher calls can be parallelized. Um, it also has some disadvantages. Um, one of them is that it's um, a bit harder to implement because you do need to implement this field multiplication here. Uh, so you need some mathematical knowledge to start implementing this, or you need to know the right the name of the right operations. It also has the problem that it has something that is called a weak keys. So this, these are specific values of the key in which the scheme becomes completely insecure. And one of these examples are keys which map zero to zero. Because if this value here turns out to be zero, then what happens here? Well, we always have some value which would depend on the message then we multiply it by zero, giving zero. So uh, the output after all of this is definitely going to be zero, completely independent of the actual message. There are also a few other weak keys, which lead mostly to insecure values of this age here. So this is a bit of a problem. If you randomly choose a key, you are very, 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 very unlikely to pick one of those, but it's possible. Another thing that's very bad about GCM is that it's a very fragile cipher. Fragile means if you do encounter misuse, uh, in this case the misuse being nonce misuse, then you have a complete break of the cipher. So if you misuse, um, if you have only one case of nonce misuse, so there are two messages you encrypt with the same nonce, then what the attacker can learn is we will see that this depends on the nonce here. So if we, they XOR the two tags of the two messages, then this part here cancels out, leaving us with this construction here, which is essentially a polynomial multiplication. I'm not going into the details here, but by um, doing some simple um, equation solving, you can then recover this key K, uh, H here, and this is essentially the authentication key. So anything you need to know to 
uh, authenticate some ciphertext is this value h here because then you can compute all of this here and we already if you know this value here then you can also find out in one of the previous messages what this value here is for a specific nonce meaning if you have one nonce misuse you can then compute the future tags of any message you like because you have recovered this authentication key here this is very bad to protect against this sort of attacks, there are also more robust modes, including SIV, uh, which works, for example, by um, using not a random nonce, but a nonce that depends on the entire message. And this is done by first computing a MAC and then using this MAC tag as the nonce for an actual encryption scheme, which means that we automatically have a sort of nonce misuse but this nonce misuse only happens for identical messages. So only identical messages are encrypted with the same key. This of course means that we don't satisfy the security de definitions we gave in the beginning, but it can be shown that this satisfies some other security properties instead. And in particular, um, you don't get anything as bad as in this cipher here when you reuse the nonce. Um, there was also there, there were two competitions in order to find better replacements for the previous candidates because we saw now that both CCM and GCM have some significant shortcomings. And the first of these efforts was the CSER competition, which ended one and a half years ago approximately, where they searched for encryption schemes for several different use cases. So in total, there were um, three use cases and all of the initial submissions, there were almost 60 of those, so 60 cipher candidates that were submitted. Um, in total, six were selected as winners, two per, um, two per use case. So the first use case was lightweight encryption. This is something we already talked about in uh, one of the previous lectures. And here the um, first recommendation is our cipher ASCON and the second recommendation is something based on LFSRs. There were also two other use cases, namely a high performance use case. Here the idea was to have ciphers which are particularly fast in software on high-end platforms, meaning that both of these ciphers which are ranked equally, so there is no first and second place, both of these make heavy use of AES inside because high-end platforms have AES instructions and are thus very efficient. Uh, but these do it in a much cleverer way or in a more efficient way than CCM and GCM, for example, by having a much bigger state and thus being much faster overall. There is also a use case specifically for robust ciphers, meaning when you misuse the nonce or when you do decryption misuse, then these do not break quite as bad as the previous ones. They still don't satisfy the original security definition, but they satisfy some alternative security definitions. And um, so one of the two candidates here is OCB, which looks like this. So this looks like a bit complicated at first glance, but it's actually relatively straightforward. It might remind you a bit of a candidate we saw already, namely of electronic codebook mode. But unlike electronic codebook mode, which simply put the message into the block cipher into always the same block cipher and take the cipher text this does something different it essentially builds a tweakable block cipher by having not only the messages and input here but an additional value the tweak and this is something that depends on the nonce plus on the current block counter like in counter mode and this um, additional tweak here modifies the operation of this tweakable block cipher, which I've marked with the dashes. And this tweakable block cipher inside is nothing other than a normal block cipher and adding the tweak before and afterwards. Now, this is not the most secure way of building a, uh, a tweakable block cipher. This mode is a lot better if you use, um, or general modes are a lot better if you use a dedicated um, tweakable block cipher, which already includes this tweak here inside the uh, block cipher operation like the round keys uh, but it's still pretty good because you can still completely parallelize this because the only thing that's sequential is the increase of this counter here so this is the encryption part 
we also have um, uh, uh, MAC computation here, which is also very simple. So it uses the same sort of tweakable block cipher, but it simply puts in the XOR of all message blocks. Now, generally, as you would see in the exercises, using the XOR of message blocks um, as a value to encrypt is a pretty bad idea. However, um, in the specific case of OCB, it actually works out uh, because of the way that the other blocks are computed. You will see some slightly tweaked variants of this cipher in the exercises and will then probably figure out the difference why this one is the better version. So what's to be said about OCB? It's very efficient. It's highly parallelizable. Sorry, that's the door. I quickly need to open that. Be right back. Sorry for the interruption. So um, I was saying that, um, um, yeah, so this is highly parallelizable, uh, only needs one block cipher call per block. Um, what are the disadvantages? Why are not we not using this all over the place? Um, one of the reasons is that um, this way of constructing a block cipher has some adverse effects on the security level, so on the number of blocks we can encrypt safely. Another issue is that um, there used to be uh, some patents on the cipher and it was not always clear for which sort of applications it can be used without violating the patents and for which ones it can be used. Um, since it entered the CESAR competition, this seems to be a bit clearer, so most applications, in particular open source applications, shouldn't need to worry about um, violating patents, but it's still one big downside. Um, there is one other fine big downside, and that is was only discovered recently. Namely, this mode of operation has had several versions, version 1, 2, and 3. The current one that is used everywhere is 3, and that's a good thing too, because um, about a year ago, or maybe two, um, it was discovered that versions 1 and 2 are com actually completely insecure. So they have a very significant bug that completely breaks the security properties. And this was not discovered for many, many years. Um, and this happened even though there was a security proof for this mode. But it turns out that there was one property um, of, these, of this counter construction that the proof didn't model. And cryptanalysts didn't have a closer look because they thought there is a proof, why should I have a closer look? So, um, this flaw remained undiscovered for a very, very long time. But still, this is an interesting design with an alternative primitive. Um, finally, at the very end, um, I want to show one other construction which also uses a different primitive, namely this time um, a permutation. Somebody correctly identified the meow sound, so the cat is back and will help me explain what this example or this application of a sponge to authenticated encryption looks like. So what I've illustrated here looks a bit like a normal sponge in the middle, but it has some special finalization and initialization rules that I want to explain briefly. And this mode of operation is um, more or less exactly what we use in the ASCON cipher. And of course it's inspired by the sponge constructions um, as was introduced by SHA-3 and which you can have a look again in the hash lecture. So what does it work like? Let's first have a look at the plain text processing phase. So how does it encrypt one plain text block? It has this internal stream that is used throughout the cipher, which looks a bit like CBC, for example, or like the stream in, in sponges. And it also has, like there, an outer part and an inner part. And any operation we do with the message only occurs in the outer part. So to encrypt the message, what we do is we take the current value of this outer part, XOR the message block, and the result is the current ciphertext block. So it's a sort of, it looks a bit like a stream encryption here, but we also use this resulting ciphertext block to overwrite the current um, value of the of the outer part, meaning it's not really a stream cipher because the 
message block does influence the state of the cipher. We don't do anything in this capacity part here. So this is done for all message blocks and something similar is also done for all associated data block except that we don't give anything out because we said we don't need to encrypt the associated data. So that's the data processing part. You see again there's only one call to the primitive for each block. However, the blocks here are quite a bit smaller than the size of the permutation. Um, so what do the initialization and finalization look like and how do the key and nos get in? They get in at the beginning and at the end. So in the beginning we initialize the state based on the key and the nonce and then we apply the permutation to mix these two together. So after this step here we have an initial state which depends on the nonce and on the key but you can't directly read them out of there. And to make sure that reading out the nonce and key is really not possible if you know this value here, we XOR the key once again here. Which means if by some means you learn one of these intermediate results here, the complete state, you cannot compute backwards because you don't know this value of the key that we, you would need here. Which you would need to guess before you can go back here. So that's the initialization. So it prepares a secret and nonce dependent state and then processes like this. And at the end we have a similar construction. So we don't give out um, the entire state because that would allow to know anything that goes in here. So we need to add a, to append another permutation and then only give out part of the state and only as much as we need for the nonce. So the permutation size is a lot bigger than the size of the tag. In case of ASCON, this is 320 bits and the tag is just 128 bits. We also use the key again here. Um, again, so that if you know the intermediate result here for some reason, for example with a side channel attack or some other means, you cannot compute forwards to create the tag and thus create a forgery. Um, and again, we use it two times with the permutation in between so that you can't go in either direction here. Um, one other thing to mention here is that since this mode is so robust with respect to the attacker learning something about the intermediate results here, um, and because we have such a large state, we can actually use a more lightweight permutation in here. So here and here we have um, permutation calls with full security in the case of ASCON 12 rounds, whereas here we can use something more lightweight, so a round reduced version of the primitive, making the whole thing a lot faster. And this is also why, or one of the reasons why this is an, um, a lightweight authenticated cipher in, uh, compared to the previous ones. So it's currently also competing in this lightweight competition I've already mentioned last week. Uh, together with an other um, sponge-based mode of operation which targets the um, robust use case essentially, but it's still relatively lightweight at least in terms of, in terms of area. It's not very fast, but it's, uh, it needs a low area. This is not over yet, we're still waiting for a decision, but we're very much looking forward. So what's the conclusion for uh, today? Um, symmetric schemes are used to protect the confidentiality of, of data and usually we want to protect in addition also its integrity and authenticity, meaning usually we want an authenticated encryption mode. And um, the security of these built again on primitives and they define again a mode of operation that um, creates a scheme with arbitrary size inputs from the primitive with fixed size inputs. Um, there are a number of pitfalls when you combine primitives to achieve both goals some of which we saw. And there are also a number of other things that you should be aware of whenever you use a, you use a symmetric scheme for something. And you always need to be aware of what it protects and what it does not protect. So for example, an example from the previous lecture, if you use a hash function, it does not protect the context of the value in the sense of, for example, um, which version of the uh, file is the most current one, so any hash value of a previous one will remain valid as well, or um, 
how should the bit stream that I hash be interpreted? Is it a PDF? Is it an zip archive? Is it an executable file? Whatever. All of this is not directly um, protected by, uh, by the scheme. Pure encryption schemes don't protect confidentiality, but usually you very definitely want this confidentiality. Uh, sorry, this authenticity. And um, finally, so while auth uh, authenticated encryption seems to protect everything, there are still some things it does not hide. So it hides the content of the message, but it does not hide any metadata. For example, it does not hand, uh, hide who the sender and the recipient are, it does also not hide what the length of the message is. So this might also already be enough for an adversary to learn something about the message. For example, again, if they know that the message is one of three values and these three values have different lengths, then by just seeing the length, you might identify it. This is an example how you can, for example, um, fingerprint which websites a user is surfing to, not by, in this case, also knowing the address, but by knowing the length of the data that the, um, that the user receives, which may identify or provide information about which of a number of websites it is. Or the timing, so at which time something was sent. So all of these um, additional properties are not hidden, only the content of the message. Okay, um, that was a bit of an overlong lecture, uh, probably because we took a bit more time in the beginning. Um, so thanks to those who are patient enough to still be here. And again, we do have some time for questions, if you have any. So I'll wait, uh, I don't know, half a minute or so if anything appears, and otherwise I'd close the stream. In any case, um, thanks a lot for watching and um, if after this course you still have some questions for example related to the exam just ask on discord and if you were one of the people who said that they don't want to use discord for the exam let me know what specific problems you have and how we can fix them um, in case you don't come, come up with any questions i do have one um, for you Namely, um, I was wondering um, how easy you found it so far to follow the, the content of the course. So do you think that um, nobody has <laughs> selected that it's completely simple and you understood everything? There are a few who say that um, you understand most of what I said, but some parts are tricky. Most of you seem to believe that you do understand some parts, but um, there are still many things that are hard and some of you find it completely incomprehensible. So in particular, those two groups here, if you have any more specific feedback about which things you want to explain, to have explained more clearly, um, I'd be happy for those either to help you this year or to prepare me for uh, next year. For example, knowing where I should um, add additional explanations on the handout slides or stuff like that would be very helpful for me. Okay, so it seems pretty tight between the more optimistic and the less optimistic people with a bit more on this side here. Um, okay, so if you have anything specific, let me know. Let's see if any questions have appeared. This does not really seem to be the case. So in that case, I will um, close the stream at this point and have a nice weekend. See you next time. Again in the same setup. However, not next week because the exercise exam will take longer than the usual exercises. So we won't have time for a lecture. We would have time for something very short. So in particular, if one of these people here has something in particular that they want re-explained or that they want some examples of this is something i can could do in a shorter lecture otherwise if i get no suggestions then um, there would be no lecture next week and we would meet each other again in two weeks time for some asymmetric cryptography okay so again have a nice weekend and the cat greets you as well